It's good to see all of you this morning. I see a few people who are here for Christmas, and uh, so welcome home. It's good to have all of you this morning. Before we jump into the Word this morning, I want to just go to the Lord and ask Him to open our hearts, amen, amen. to His Word. We should never really go to the Word and read it and expect it to do anything if we don't go to God and ask Him to speak. You know, I think that's a misconception people have. They say, well, if I read it, everything will change. You know, there's New Testament scholars who are atheists who believe that they can understand the New Testament and they are void of the Holy Spirit. And they study it, they read it day in and day out, and then they communicate it to people and they act as if they know all about it without even the Spirit that has written it. And so it's important for us to go to the Spirit, amen, and let Him speak. So, Father, we just ask you in this moment that our hearts will be pliable before you, or that you would do, you ask the question to Jeremiah the prophet, can I not do with you, O Israel, as the prophet does, with, or the potter does with the clay, can I not mold you? And so, Father, we just want to be molded by you today. Lord, we recognize that in this journey of faith, Lord, we are in a battle that has to be fought, but we know that you're fighting this battle, and you've called us as your church to stand upon what you've done. Lord, and it's not always easy. And so, Lord, I recognize this morning as people have come into this place, Lord, your body, or maybe the people who have come into this place who don't know you, they're not a part of your body yet. Lord, and we're in the battle, and we feel tired, or we feel weak. Lord, and so I just pray for strength and encouragement to them today. Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to see what the enemy is doing, not that we might focus on it, but that we would be not unaware of it. Father, and that you would help us in all things to go to you, run to you, Lord, and lean on you. Empower us, we pray. Lord, let every word that's spoken today be preached to every one of us, including this person on the platform. Lord, I love you. We love you, God, and we give you praise today. And as church said, amen. Amen. Well, as we jump into the, the message this morning, we've been in a series on Ephesians since July. And if you're just joining us, that's a lot for you to catch up on. Um, the good news is, is we have all these sermons on our website and in our app, um, the Central Assembly app you can download on your phone, even while you're sitting here. That's okay if you'd like to do that. Just don't listen to them while we're, okay? That would, that would not work well. But just let me give you a little bit of a quick update, um, you know, just a review on where we've been. You know, we're in chapter 6 this morning. You can go ahead and turn there. We're going to be in verse 10. And so we've been in lots of different places throughout Ephesians, right? We, chapters 1 and 2, we talked about how Paul is saying, hey, the grace of God, it changes us, it challenges us, it transforms us. And then by virtue of that, we have chapters 3, 4, and 5 that really unpack exactly what that looks like. What does it look like to live a life of faith? because of the grace of Christ in our everyday life, and then it affects our relationships. I know there's actually been several of you who have you know, shared some th cool testimonies with me over just from this last week. Last Sunday we talked about what it looks like to live a life of faith in the workplace. How many of you were challenged by that last week? I had a few comments. I've even had a couple testimonies of people just saying, you know, I put into practice what we talked about, and I'm watching God do something in the lives of my employers and you know, my, you know, the, different, the, the, the people around me. And that's awesome to see that. Now I will say, don't let your guard down. Because just about the moment we think we got that figured out is about the time the enemy wants to hit us in the mouth. Remind us exactly how human we are, how much we make mistakes, right? And then we have an opportunity to walk right back into those offices and apologize and walk out grace with them. And so we have to just be on our guard, and which kind of leads us to talking about what I want to talk about today. As we look at the text, we look at verses uh, 6, 10 through 12, we see Paul begin to share some very militaristic language. Okay, how many of you are military buffs? Like you really enjoy military things. Maybe, how many of you really love military movies? Okay, I love military movies. Like... When I was a kid, my, well, not a really young kid, but when I was a young teenager, 
my dad and I, it was one of the ways that we bonded. We would watch these military movies. Now, my dad being a military guy and me watching it, and of course, he loved to tell the military things as we're watching the movie, and he loved to share all the military details, and, you know, and he, he like, they'd say things or they'd do things. I'm like, I don't know what's going on here, and he'd, he'd set the positive movie, and he'd have to explain it to me. Come on, how many of you have parents like that? They take it as an opportunity to say, now I can share my wisdom, Right? Well, I have a few of my favorite movies. One of my favorite movies of all time, military-wise, is We Were Soldiers with Mel Gibson. How many of you cry? Come on, men. Anybody cry when you watch that movie? I cry every single time I watch that movie. Like Mel Gibson, and he's looking at his sergeant major, and they're having this moment, and you think they're going to die, and you're like, I'm just like, I'm crying. You're like, I'm just like, oh, man. Like, but if you haven't seen it, I don't want to spoil the movie. It's a good movie. But I'm going to reference it a couple times today, just kind of off the cuff, and so I just wanted to bring you into that a little so today I want to talk about foxhole faith. Foxhole faith. Let me define what a foxhole is, just in case you are really thinking, and it really is just a hole where a fox is. Okay, that's actually not what we're talking about. Okay, we're, we're talking about what Cambridge Dictionary defines as a small hole dug in the ground during a war or military attack used by a small group of soldiers as a base for shooting at the enemy and as a shelter from attack. I've heard a few phrases when it comes to foxholes. Maybe you've heard these phrases too. I've heard things like, there are no atheists in foxholes. How many of you have heard that? Because when you're in the foxhole and the war is raging around you, you can't do anything but pray to God, right? Because what else you got to do in that moment? I've also heard that battles are won in the foxholes. I've also heard that you don't fight for the war, winning the war as much as you fight for the person next to you in the foxhole. How many of you would identify with that? Like when you're on the battlefield, you recognize you're not fighting just to win the war. You're fighting because of the person next to you. It's a big deal. Camaraderie and the brotherhood is a huge part of war, right? It's one of the things that is developed in us. In fact, there's been this show called uh, Bond of Brothers, right? Band of Brothers, where it talks about how you are formed into brotherhood by the blood that you shed, Something happens when you fight with each other towards a goal. Well, Paul is kind of giving us that picture. In Ephesians chapter 6, he starts this way in verse 10. He says, a final word, and I'm reading from the NLT today. It says, oh, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. He says, put on all of God's armor so that you will be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. And then Paul gives almost this little bit of a disclaimer here. He reminds us, because you can almost be picturing the fight that we're all in, it's like, oh man, I just want to punch someone in the mouth, right? And Paul stops right there and he says, now hold on a second. He says, for we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies. It's almost like Paul knew that we needed to have a little bit of a reminder because how many of you have thought that the person across from you was an enemy? Come on, are you interacting this morning? Have you ever thought that? Like, have you, like you've had this, this, like everything inside you as you see them walk up bristles? Because you're like, okay, I'm going to have to get ready because it's coming at me. Right? Okay. I, thought, I just figured, I'm like, if I'm the only one that's felt that, I probably just need to go hang out with a psychiatrist a lot more. Yeah, it probably isn't maybe necessary anyway. But, but, I think it's just good for us all to remember that we, we, we think this way more than we realize. And Paul is reminding us, he says, we are not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against rulers and authorities of the unseen world. It's almost like Paul had to remind us that, hold on a second, you're, you're not fighting against flesh and blood, but that doesn't mean that you're fight, fighting against physical rulers either because that's easier to want us to just how many of you know it'd be a lot easier if we just knew that our leaders in our country are our enemy we could see him we could identify it we could see it but that's not what Paul's saying he says now hold on a second even the rulers and authorities that we face are of the unseen world against mighty powers in this dark world and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. How many of you can recognize by us reading through that, that Paul is not talking about the tangible that you can touch? Right? He's talking about what you can't touch. 
Now, I will say this. We will recognize as we go through this today that although we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, we can know that the enemy very well uses people like puppets for his purposes. Okay, so we're not saying that there's no involvement and they're not allowing that to happen. There is that that happens. But it's important for us to remember that that is not the root of our problem that we're facing. Okay, the root of what we're facing is an enemy who has an agenda against each and every one of us. Three things today I want to talk about. The first one is this. And really, just a little caveat for this. This is really three different altar calls today. Okay? As we're talking about this through teaching team, I just, I really felt that, that there's, there's really three different altar calls. There's going to be three different sections of this. It's probably going to hit you differently, depending on where you're at. Okay, and so just recognize that. And I might even stop and just take a moment to allow the Holy Spirit to to work on your heart in the middle of those before we move on to the next point. So I'm just prepping you a little bit. It's going to be a little bit different this morning. And so here's the first one. I want you to write this down. Foxholes test our strength. You know, how, how many of you have seen movies like The Battle of the Bulge where the Germans are advancing against the American lines and they're advancing against the foxholes and they'd send waves of Germans just to see where the foxholes are and how strong are your defenses. They wanted to see if you can repel their attack, right? On some level, foxholes, they test our strength. When we're in that foxhole, the strength of that foxhole really is determined by the encouragement or discouragement of the people in the foxhole. Because the thing about a foxhole is, is once you get in it, the only easy way out is backwards. Foxholes are designed so that the enemy can't get into it easily. And it's designed so you can easily brace yourself up against it and shoot in one direction. Because how many of you know you don't want to shoot the wrong direction? But there's an entrance into the foxhole. And it's very easy to take that back way out. And so the enemy wants to test our strength. There's a great book that I read, you know, many times, actually. It's by a guy named Watchman Nee. It's a little book. It's about 78 pages, and it's a book entitled Sit, Walk, Stand. How many of you have ever heard of that book before? Oh, many of you, actually. That's great. It's a terrific book. 78 pages is one of the best commentaries, in my opinion, on the book of Ephesians. Basically, Watchman Nee walks through the book of Ephesians, and he says that he believed that the Christian life was defined by three words, sit, walk, stand. And he talked about how we are supposed to sit in Christ, which is chapters one through three, and then you're supposed to walk, which is four through five and through you know, the beginning of six, and then you have stand where you're supposed to stand against the enemy at the end of the book. And so he has this quote in his book where he says, the Greek verb stand with its following preposition against in verse 11 really means hold your ground. There is a precious truth hidden in that command of God. It is not a command to invade foreign territory. Warfare in modern parlance would imply a command to march. But we're not told to march. Armies march into other countries to occupy and subdue. God has not told us to do this. We are not told to march, but to stand. And there's reasons for that. I'm going to get into that as we get into the message this morning. Foxholes are meant to hold the ground that has already been won until reinforcements arrive. This brings to mind 1 Peter chapter 1, or chapter 5, verse 8. It says, stay alert, watch out for the great enemy, the devil. He prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Stand firm against him and be strong in your faith. Remember that your family of believers all over the world is going through the same kind of suffering you are. Because how many of you know when, you can, when someone else can identify with your pain, there's strength in that. All right, so Peter's saying, remember, there's people all over the world who are going through the same stuff. He says, in his kindness, God called you to share in his eternal glory by means of Christ Jesus. So after you've suffered a little while, he will restore, support, and strengthen you. And he will place you on a firm foundation. This brings to mind for me when I hear that scripture, it brings to mind Joshua 1. 
three times in that scripture, Joshua is told by the Lord to be strong and courageous. You remember that? He was right after Moses had died, he's getting ready to enter the promised land. And Joshua is scared, I'm sure. The text doesn't tell us that. So you could say that we're superimposing into the text here, except with the exception to this is that the Lord told Joshua three times. How many of you have ever had to tell your child that it was okay more than once? Why? Because they weren't getting it, right? Because the fear was so overwhelming that they weren't hearing the correction. They weren't hearing the encouragement. They weren't hearing it, so you had to tell them again and again, and you had to get their attention. Sometimes you even have to get down on their level and say, listen to me. You don't need to be afraid, right? You ever had those moments? Maybe you've had those moments with the Lord where the Lord has to get eye to eye with you and say, listen to me. You do not need to be afraid. Be strong and courageous. There's this moment in Joshua 1.9, the last time that the Lord says this, he says, this is my command. This isn't an option. This is the command. He says, be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or discouraged. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. It's that moment when you're afraid as a child and your parent says, I'm going to go with you. Right? How many of you have had that moment as a parent or as a child where you recognize, like, oh, that gives you a lot of comfort when you know that your dad's going to walk in the room with you? There was um, the story that we heard. <laughs> a few of you are ready for this. You've been waiting for this moment. You know, there's this devotion that we've been doing as a, as a team during our staff meetings. It's from Dr. George Wood, his devotion, A Psalm in Your Heart. Dr. George Wood was one of my favorite people. I had the opportunity to meet him in 2019, had a 15-minute conversation with him, and it was one of the highlights of my, of my ministry, honestly, to sit down with this guy. He just loved the Lord so much. And if you don't know who he was, he was, one of, he was our general superintendent for many years in the Assemblies of God. He was kind of the one in charge of the National Assemblies of God. Anyway, he wrote this book, and it's really hard to find, actually, but I had just been given one about 15 years ago, and I'm glad I hung on to it because you can't really buy it much anymore. But he basically walks through the 150 Psalms, and he does it in such a beautiful way. Our staff, we've really, really enjoyed it. Well, he had a devotion for Psalm 12. Um, I believe it was this last week. And, uh, and so I actually looked it up this morning because I was going to share the story. But I actually looked it up this morning. There's more to this story, and my team doesn't, hasn't even heard this yet. Um, and so I looked it up, and I want to talk to you about the Pike Syndrome. There's a classic, the pike syndrome. So if you know what a pike is, it's a very long, toothy fish who's very aggressive and angry, okay? Um, we have them here in Montana. Just ask Bob Kemp. He can take you fishing for pike, right, Bob? But it says this. Um, so this is off of the, the website, um, the source for this uh, pike syndrome. Um, the Rainmaker Companies talks about it. It says, a classic experiment was conducted in 1873 by a German zoologist by the name of Car Dr. Carl Mobius. That's, that's quite the name, just saying. But Dr. Mobius put a large pike in a tank of water and fed the pike small bait fish. After a while, he divided the tank by inserting a heavy pane of glass into it. Then he dropped the small prey fish into the section separated from the pike by the glass. The pike, an aggressive, voracious eater, charged the little fish, and it charged over and over, and each time the pike charged into the fish to eat them, it crashed violently into the pane of glass. Sometimes it was so stunned by the impact that it floated upside down for a few minutes before recovering its senses. After a number of painful attempts, the pike gave up and no longer tried to get at the bait fish. Now when Dr. Mobius finally removed the pane of glass, the pike and his prey peacefully shared the tank. The pike had learned that pursuing the prey fish caused severe headaches. And so from then on, it would only eat food given to it by Dr. Mobius. Now, researchers in US, the U.S. and Canada, and this is the part that we had heard, have repeated Dr. Mobius' experiment with the same results. They found that the pike would lay on the bottom of the tank, depressed and dejected, without much interaction, because the pike truly believed that the minnows were out of reach and inaccessible. 
The pike would literally starve to death. Even his minnows swam around and bumped into to its head and mouth right in front of its face. It would literally not eat and it would die. In fact, this is such a strange phenomenon that psychologists call this the pike syndrome. And it is this reluctant and fearful behavior that is based on assumptions that are no longer true but has since become known as that, the pike syndrome. So like when you believe something and you've had experiences, it has the potential to lay you down at the bottom of the container to starve to death. How many of you have ever felt so discouraged that you're that pike on the bottom of the, of the tank, right? Like, what do I do? It's a dangerous place to be. It reminds me of one of my favorite Bible stories, just simply because I, I feel like it's one of the most tense moments of King David's life. But we don't talk about it very much. We don't hear about it very much. And it's found in 1 Samuel at the end of the, of the, the book. It talks about David before he becomes the king of Israel. It talks about how him and his mighty men, they were out doing battle in different places, and they had come back to their home, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been captured. They'd been captured by the Amalekites while they were away. And so just picture that for a moment. You come home from this great, great victory, and you come home to your town burned and all the people taken. Think about your family for a moment. Think about your, your wife and children. How would you feel, men, walking into that place, realizing they're all gone? Well, oh, man, we, we would be maybe even beyond that, right? I mean, we would be to a point of, I mean, there, there's lots of emotions. Like, you want to rip whoever is, you know, who did this, you want to rip their head off, right? But then there's also this feeling of this deep, deep, what do I do now? Like there's this anguish. Listen to how scripture defines it in chapter 30, verse 6. It says, and David was greatly distressed for the people. <laughs> Listen to why he was distressed. It says, because the people spoke of stoning him. That would make me distressed too. Like that, 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 that would hurt a lot. Big heavy rocks. Pelted until you're dead. Like they were upset. I understand. Okay. They were very upset. I pursue them, and then they go and they overtake them, and they win them all back, and not one of the people was missing or had been killed. The Lord was able to rescue their families through David. But David had to first strengthen himself in the Lord his God. So here's, here's my question for you this morning. Is your strength being tested? Are you finding yourself lacking in strength for the fight that we need to fight? Just take a moment. Would you just bow your heads for just a moment? If you're in here this morning and you say, you know what? I need to be strengthened by the Lord because I feel like that pike at the bottom of the container. And I know I need strength if I'm going to fight this fight. If that's you, would you just lift your hand up where you're at? I'm just going to take a moment and pray for you. There's a few. Father, I just pray right now for every single person in this room, Lord, that needs your strength. Father, you are able to remind us that it is not hopeless. Lord, you're able to strengthen us, Lord, although we feel like we have no strength. Lord, you're able to mobilize us to do what you've asked us to do when we feel like we have no ability or even passion or even direction or purpose. Lord, you are the one who gives us purpose. So, Father, I just pray today, Lord, that you would infuse into every single person who's lacking strength, the strength needed for the battle, that you would do what you did for David and you would strengthen them in you. In Jesus' name. The second thing that I want to talk about this morning is foxholes reveal the enemy. Foxholes reveal the enemy. I remember when I was watching that movie, we were soldiers, and, and there was a, a platoon that was cut off from all the others, and, and they're sitting there, and 
and they can't see anything. They, they don't know where the enemy is coming from. They just assume, rightfully, that the enemy was coming, right? It was right about that time that one of the illumination mortars went off and the whole area lit up. And when the, the whole area lit up, lo and behold, the enemy was upon them. But before you could see nothing. It was black. You couldn't do anything about it. But the minute that that light hit the sky, the guns went off, right? Because they recognized the enemy was right there. See, one of the things that foxholes do in our lives is it reveals the enemy. When I say foxholes reveal the enemy, what I'm saying is how many of you recognize that when you're in a battle and you dig in with the Lord and you begin looking at it with his eyes, the eyes of light, you begin to see, oh, the enemy's at work here. It's really, really hard for us to recognize that the enemy is at work when we're so focused on the people that we think are the enemy, right? Or we're focusing on ourselves. It's really hard to see what the enemy's trying to do. Now, this isn't an invitation for us to look under every bush, right? We're not saying, oh, there's an enemy under, under every bush. But what we are saying is that the enemy is more active than the church gives him credit for sometimes. And sometimes we're caught slumbering when the enemy is working. And many times he likes to work in the church. Right? He wants to get in our relationships. He wants to get the church against the pastor. He wants to get you against the person in the next pew from you. He wants to get all of us doing this. How many of you understand what I'm saying? Like he wants to get at us. And I think he's been trying to do that here at Central for a long time. But the Lord's been opening our eyes to what's been going on. And so now we're being able to look and say, oh, look, the, oh, look, here's the enemy working in these different areas and these different places. And we recognize that we're not the enemy, but the enemy is trying to work. And there's been times where I'm sure every single one of us on some level has been used by the enemy without even realizing it. It's one of the things we need to pray that the Lord would open our eyes to see what he's doing. One of the things that Watchman Nee says in his book, he says, the word stand implies that the ground disputed by the enemy is really God's and therefore it is ours. We need not struggle to gain a foothold on it. Today we war against Satan only to maintain and consolidate the victory which Christ has already gained. Perspective matters, right? If we have this perspective that we have to win all this stuff for the Lord then I think we're missing what God has already done. He's done the heavy lifting, but what we're called to do is to fight to hold that which he's done. Come on, somebody. Like We need to hold what the gospel is. We need to hold on to what the gospel is, that Christ came to save sinners of whom I'm the worst. Right? He gave us the grace for this. We need to hold on to that. We need to recognize that if Christ has done everything to defeat the enemy and we're just waiting for the final bugle, the final trumpet to be sounded, for him to say, oh yeah, all of it's done now. Like how many of you have read Revelation 19? It's funny, Revelation is one of the most well-read books in all the world. It's like people who don't even necessarily know Jesus have read Revelation. <laughs> it's funny, I don't know. Like, they're like, well... I just gave my heart to Christ, and I just went and read Revelation. I'm like, that's nah, probably not the first one you should read. But um, anyway, there's people, <laughs> just a little discipleship one-on-one, like, don't go to the most confusing book in all of Scripture first. That's just a good idea not to do that, right? Go read John or Mark or something, like, get to know Jesus and then Romans and that kind of thing. But anyway, so they end up in Re Revelation at some point. And there's a chapter in Revelation in chapter 19 where it talks about the rider on the white horse, right, talks about Jesus. What stands out to me so much when I read that scripture is the fact that we're not mentioned really. Come on, Lord, what about us? You know? No, because it wasn't really about us. It says that the rider on the white horse who was coming to do some business. It talks about the sword that would come forth from his mouth, that he would take care of his, his, all his enemies. And I'm like, but what about us, Lord? Where are we at? 
It's amazing how much of the story where the Lord does the work. He fights the battle. And we just get to sit there with the popcorn. Not quite. But that's what it feels like a little bit. Like we're just watching the show. Watching him take care of business. For some of you, you have that song in your head. Just get it out. Taking care of business. Anyway. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, Paul, he's talking to the Corinth church, and they've had some issues. Okay, they've had some things arise within the church. Paul's had to give discipline to different members of the church. He's had to tell the church, oh, this person needs to be, really, there's been times even Paul had to say to one, says that they, shouldn't even, they should be removed from the church for a while. So there's some strong things that Paul says. But then he also talks about how there needs to also be the operation of forgiveness within the church. And listen to what he says about a particular person who had wronged him and the church. And in verse 5 he says, I'm not overstating it when I say that the man who caused all the trouble and uh, hurt all of you more than he hurt me. You ever had somebody hurt you in the church? He says, most of you opposed him, and that was punishment enough. Now, however... It is time to forgive and comfort him. Otherwise, he may be overcome by discouragement. So I urge you now to reaffirm your love for him. Interesting language. Paul's talking about somebody who's done wrong in the church. He says, yeah, there's time to discipline. Yeah, there's time to to be strong on things. But then he says, but don't forget to also love this person, and there's a time to restore them, right? Right? Paul talks about that in Galatians 6 when he says, restore them gently. But then watch how he he ties this together. He says, reaffirm your love for him. I wrote to you as I did to test you and see if you would fully comply with my instructions. He says, when you forgive this man, I forgive him too. And when I forgive whatever needs to be forgiven, I do so with Christ's authority for your benefit. Which uh, Jesus did say that. He told his disciples to forgive. As you forgive them, it will be forgiven them. Okay? But listen to what he says next. He says, so that Satan, the enemy, the devil, the adversary, all these different names that he has, so that Satan will not outsmart us, for we are familiar with his evil schemes. Now, you've probably heard that scripture, but maybe you didn't hear it in that context. So what Paul is saying is, is that if you are not careful to watch for what the enemy's doing, he says one of the things the enemy wants to do is he wants to get you into a place where you're judging and biting and devouring one another. He says, and if you pay attention, you will see there's an opportunity for the enemy to do evil through you. But I encourage you to do good and do what the Lord says in the middle of that. That's why it's so important for us as the church to be in prayerful consideration to how are we handling each other. Because if we don't, Paul says, he says, this is an opportunity for the devil to win in this area of your life as a church. The battle that we are fighting is not caused by the people in front of us, but the enemy behind them. It's important for us to remember that. The battle that we are fighting is not caused by the people in front of us, but the enemy behind them. We do not want to be used by the enemy. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul says this. He says, for though we walk in the flesh, right? We're flesh. We're human flesh, right? He says, although we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. We're not going to go get our AR-15 to deal with the enemy. Although, how many of you wish it was that way? It would just be easier. Come on, somebody. But that's not the way we fight. That's not how we fight the devil, I would say, right? We don't fight the devil with an AR-15. Paul says we fight differently. He says, for the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. And we take every thought captive to obey Christ. That's an interesting thing. We we remember that scripture. We talk a lot about like, oh, take every thought captive. Take every thought captive. 
It's interesting to me that one of the weapons, which weapons are usually used on other people, right? But one of the weapons of our warfare is actually to take control of our mind. That's interesting to me because weapons typically are outward, right? It's, it's against someone else. But Paul says, don't forget to use that weapon that the Lord gives us here because this is where the battle is being fought to. That's interesting. The enemy wants to get in our head. He wants to do different things within us. He wants to share these things like, oh, well, they don't really love you because you're flawed and they, they don't know all the secrets of your life. And, so, and the Lord doesn't love you. How can he possibly love you? Like, he knows everything you've done. You're just fooling yourself. Come on. Have you ever heard those things being said in your brain? That's the enemy trying to come against you. And so Paul says we take every th thought captive to the obedience of Christ. What that means is we say, what does this mean? Jesus, I go right to him and say, what does your word say about me? What does your word say about the church? What does your word say about how I interact with people? What does it say about how I interact with the world? Like we don't take what the enemy says and apply that. We judge everything that's coming through this brain of ours. Because how many of you know there's a lot of radio waves? There's a lot of things going into this brain right here. And we have to filter through it. We have to filter through it because we want the gold. We want the gold in there. If you want to learn something about that, you should talk to Bob Rostek about gold panning. We don't just want the junk. We don't want the iron pyrite. We want the real stuff. And so what we're doing is we're filtering through our brain through the lens of the word of God saying what's gold and what's not. Because we want the gold. Because all the other stuff is just sinking sand. So let me ask you this question. Where's the enemy trying to work in your work and relationships? Where is he trying to work in your life, your relationships, in your mind? How is he trying to use you? So I'm going to have you bow your heads. This is another little spot we're going to stop. If you bow your heads for just a moment, if you're in this place and you just say, you know what, I know that the enemy has been trying to do things in my life. And I've struggled to recognize it and resist it. And I want God's clarity and his strength to resist it. If that's you this morning, just lift your hand up where you're at. We're going to pray. Yeah, there's many of us this morning. See, the, the Lord wants to work in our life. The enemy wants to work in our life. And we only want one of them working in our life. And so, Father, right now I pray in the name of Jesus to all the works of the enemy that are coming against us, Lord, I pray that you would illuminate them for what they are so we can identify what the enemy is and what it isn't. Lord, that you would help us to understand that. Help us to, to recognize within our foxholes as we stand next to brothers and sisters in the Lord, Father, that sometimes they're going to see the enemy before we do. Help us to have a humble heart and be ready to receive the correction and to receive clarity in the foxhole, Lord, as we're looking at the enemy saying, oh, that is the enemy, that is the enemy. Father, I pray you would help us in that. Lord, I also pray, God, that you would give us the courage necessary to viciously remove the enemy from our life. Lord, with your strength and your power, Lord, that we would stand against him and we would not allow him to have any more authority in our life. We would reje reject the power of the enemy and all that he wants for us. Lord, we believe that you're going to give people freedom from the attack of the enemy that's gotten in. Lord, you're going to put up walls so he can't keep doing that. Lord, help us to know how to do that. Help us to know how to reinforce the foxhole and identify the enemy. In Jesus' name. This leads us to the third thing. Foxholes lead us to Jesus. Foxholes lead us to Jesus. Because who we're holding out for, the one that we want in our foxholes, is what Paul called the commander-in-chief. He actually refers to Jesus as our commander-in-chief. How many of you know that our commander-in-chief, he is flawless. He's able. 
to fight the enemy, and he's even defeated the enemy. And he stands with us in that foxhole. We recognize we don't, we're not strong because of our own ability. Paul says in Ephesians 6, 10, he says, Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. If you do that, if you put on his armor, which we're going to talk about that next week, we're going to unwrap the armor of God. See what we did there? It's Christmas. Anyway, okay. I thought it was good. That's fine. We're going to put on all of God's armor. We're going to talk about what that looks like. So that we can stand. Watchman Nee concludes this way. He says, thus, today we do not fight for victory. We fight from victory. We must not ask the Lord to enable us to overcome the enemy, nor even look to him to overcome, but praise him now because he has. Do you see what it means to stand? We do not try to gain ground. We merely stand on the ground on which the Lord Jesus has gained for us, and we resolutely refuse to be moved from it. When our eyes are really open to see Christ as our victorious Lord, then our praise flows freely and without restraint. It sounds an awful lot like what Jesus said in John 10.10 when he says, The thief comes only so that he can steal, kill, and destroy, but I have come so that they may have life and have it abundantly. He wants to lead us to him. He wants to lead us to him. I'm going to invite you to stand. I'm going to invite our altar team down this morning too, if you guys are here. I know I haven't used you guys a ton recently, but if our altar team is around, I'd love to bring you up for just a little bit. I want to give us some time this morning. If you're in this place this morning, you would just say, I've been trying to fight this battle on my own. I haven't been trying to fight this battle with Christ as my power, as my empowerment, as my savior, as my victor. And I recognize that I need him today. Maybe you're in this room and, and you recognize that there's a battle, but you have had no relationship with Jesus Christ. You can't win a battle when you don't have the victory. And Jesus is the victory. And so maybe you're in this place and you just say, you know what, I, I need Jesus. Like, I, I'm not a follower of Jesus and I need him. That's the, that is what I need. If that's you, would you just lift up your hand where you're at today? There's a hand. Anybody else? Maybe you're here this morning and you say, you know what? I know Jesus. I just haven't been relying on him. I've just been doing it in my own strength, but I haven't been relying on this Lord that I know. And I find myself struggling and failing and being overcome by the enemy. And I, maybe you feel some shame and maybe you, you just really recognize that you just need to be embraced by Jesus today. And you need him to fight for you. If that's you, would you just lift your hands up where you're at? Yeah, there's many of us this morning. I just want you to close your eyes and would you just lift up your hands? Jesus, we need you today. Lord, I know we need you every day, but Right now in this moment, God, right in this place, we need you. Lord, we recognize that because there's this fight going on, Lord, we can look at this and say there's a battle that's being fought, which means there has to be a victory that has to be won. 
Lord, and we know you've already won that victory. But once again, that battle reminds us that there is an eternal wager going on in which, Lord, you have paid the wage. You've paid the payment. But it reminds us, God, there's an eternal nature to what we're going through. And so, Father, we, we know God, we have to come to you. We need Jesus at work in our life in greater ways. Lord, we need to walk with you and talk with you in the cool of the day. Lord, we need that relationship with you. And so, Lord, I just pray this morning for every person, Lord, that's feeling overwhelmed. God, they, they, they recognize that they have not relied on you to fight their battle in this very real war, God, that we're involved in. Lord, I just pray right now, God, that you would remind them of your power. Lord, that you would wrap your arms of love around them, God. There's no shame here. Lord, we recognize that you hold us in the foxhole, God. When all around us seems to be falling apart, when it seems like maybe we're going to be overrun and we're not going to be able to withstand the enemy, Lord, you, you're in the foxhole. You say, there's no way he's getting past me. And so, Jesus, I just pray right now, God, strengthen the resolve. Strengthen the resolve that we would stand. Lord, your word says multiple times that we would stand firm. God, I pray that that would be as you've said, that through the power of Christ, Lord, that every one of us would stand firm in wherever we're walking through. Lord, strengthen us. Reveal the enemy all around us. God, and lead us to you in everything that we face. Thank you, Lord. This morning, if you, if you would like some extra prayer maybe with the battle that you're facing, maybe some sp specific stuff to you and what you're going through, we have our prayer team up here, our altar team. I just I want to invite you to, to come up and spend some time with them. I'm going to bless us here in just a moment and allow those of you who feel like you need to go or, or maybe that's not for you today, and I understand that. And we'll give you some fellowship time out in the lobby. That's fine. But I also want to give you the time up here in the altar if that's something that the Lord is leading you to do. If you need some extra prayer in regards to those things. I know there's also a lot of sicknesses going around. If you need prayer for sickness, if you need healing, the Bible says call the elders of the church to pray over you, right? Well, we're doing that. Okay, we're having people pray over us with faith. The prayer of faith will make the sick person well. We believe that. And so I just want to encourage you. We're going to open up the altars for that, okay, so I'm going to bless you and I'm going to allow you to come. If you need extra prayer or the battle you're facing or anything else, really healing or whatever it might, might be on your heart and mind today. So Jesus, we love you. We thank you for you who are, Lord. I pray that you would bless us, Lord, and keep us. Cause your face to shine upon us. Lord, lift up your countenance towards us, Lord. And give us your grace, Lord. And give us your peace. In Jesus' name, as church said, amen. Amen. If you need extra prayer today, the battle you're facing, healing, or whatever else the Lord is, is encouraging you to get prayer for, we have our altar team up here. Please take advantage of that. Otherwise, you're free to fellowship out in the lobby. Please take your conversation out there. That'd be great. Thank you.